So without further ado, uh, who, who's first? Chris. Hi. I'm actually uh, not a land use planner, although uh, land use planning was certainly a big part of my curriculum. Uh, when I studied planning, I have a master's in regional planning from Cornell University. Uh, I am, however, in practice as a community and economic development planner. Um, I want to, to take a moment to mention just before we go on that uh, part of your comprehensive plan process should involve economics and we're not here to discuss that today but if you have an interest in that please do talk to me later. I'm just going to start right away on this uh, because we were teed up beautifully by the previous panel. Um, I'm calling this uh, from the ground up and uh, I think that we have some, some rural uh, elected officials here who are used to the idea that you might roll up your sleeves and get right involved in something. And I want to point out that uh, when we talk about comprehensive planning, we are not necessarily talking about something that is uh, only to uh, be done by professionals or can't involve some aspect of your town uh, cooperatively doing some of the work. So uh, for those of you who maybe are, are, are thinking, oh, you know, we just don't have budget for that, there are, there are ways that you can make this less expensive, and actually Ted is going to speak to some of those ways later. But when I say that uh, getting land use law in place is as easy as one, two, three, that is conceptually. You need to do it in the right order. It doesn't mean that you might not be, you know, looking like this guy up here. But I do want to uh, reiter reiterate that an up-to-date comprehensive plan is the foundation supporting all local land use planning laws. And if there's one slide that you make stick in your memory, this should be it. Because when you go home and say, we, you know, what did we learn? What do we have to do back in my little town that we haven't done yet? This is the place to start. This is number one. Any potential major change in possible land use in your town or other municipality requires an update of your existing comp plans. If you have a plan that somebody did back in 1982 and it's sitting on the shelf, you can be quite certain that the effects of the extractive industry under discussion here were not considered at that time. Uh, whether you want to do gas drilling and mining in, in your community, whether you don't want to do it, you still, if you have a, a land use plan, a comprehensive plan that, that is old, you need to go back and update. It's not the world's most difficult process, but it absolutely has to be done. If your town has managed without a comp plan thus far, now really might be the time to start looking at doing one. And this is true whichever direction you want to go with this. Because we've heard a bit about uh, lawsuits. I gotta tell you, lawsuits are coming from both sides, count on it. So regardless of what your, your goal is, or perhaps you don't know what your goal is, you still need to do the same process. Nan's going to cover the basics of how to create or update a comp plan. And Ted is going to talk about an impact analysis the nice thing about impact analysis is that's an opportunity for you to get together with some of your neighboring communities, perhaps with your county planning uh, staff, uh, possibly involve others in even other counties, and do some of the work together. If you do the work together, you can reduce costs. And that, that's going to be an important thing to consider because we understand where people are at with, with their small town budgets isn't always possible to do a big project by yourself. The comp plan is going to include an inventory of existing natural and man-made conditions as well as a conceptual plan for the future. And one of the things that's important to understand is the conceptual plan for the future needs to be participatory. Again, you don't want to sit down with only, as in my previous question about road use agreements, only the incoming industry and ask what their needs are and neglect to include the views of industry that is already there. You don't want to meet with one group of landowners and not another. 
So always when you're doing comprehensive planning processes, the involvement of your community in an even-handed, positive, professional manner is the way that not only you, you come to the right conclusions about what in fact it is that your community wants to be in future, but it also gives you an opportunity to diffuse conflict. And I think uh, David Kay will speak to some of that a little bit later as well. You can use a lot of state and county resources to help in conducting your inventory. Um, interestingly enough, a lot of the information you might need may already be there and you just need a little help locating it. Uh, sometimes those resources, um, you, you can get help from, uh, from local educational uh, institutions, you might be able to get some uh, classes or interns to help you with, with gathering together some of your materials. One thing you should be very careful with though, if you are going to work uh, you know, with educational institutions, is make clear what your needs are. Uh, don't, don't expect them to guide the process. And usually it'll be best if you have a professional who can help guide their work. Uh, none of us would want to be a dentist's first patient. And, you know, much, much as when I was a planning student, I appreciated the chance to work with townships. I, I don't recommend that you let a planning student write your first comp plan either. Uh, you're going to begin with context. And context is going to have something to do also with timing. Um, there is something called the Marcellus and Utica Fairway. I don't know if people, are you familiar with the term fairway? Anybody? No, just some of us, okay. The formation itself is vast, and I'll just go forward to this slide which shows it. This is the Marcellus Formation. Uh, this is right straight out of the S guys. So this could be a part of your comprehensive plan and you could just, it, it has no copyright, you could take it right from the S guys, you paid zero for that, okay? You will see that a portion of this is shaded, okay? So there is an area that is called the fairway, which is where the geologists have determined they are most likely to get the most gas. Those will be the areas where pressure for drilling will be the soonest. Uh, there was, you know, the possibility of a, uh, a, a small-scale five-county area, that, that's in the fairway. Uh, again, with the Utica Shale, the fairway is fairly similar. Now, again, this is important because you can use this information. Uh, you'll see here I have a close-up on Cayuga and Tompkins counties, both of which have some area in the fairway, some area outside the fairway. Uh, that may make a difference for your township, whether you are in or outside of the fairway. And part of the reason for that is that the impacts are not necessarily co-located with the wellhead. Now, the tax revenues are. So this is going to be of, of great interest because if, if you have leased land in your community but you're not in the fairway and neighboring community has leased land and they are, I wonder where they might put the temporary worker housing, right? So you, you need to be aware of these things uh, and take a look at that. Again, the other way you might want to begin with, with the context is to locate your municipality within the ongoing policy decision making of your neighbors. Uh, Ted will talk about how you can cooperate with your neighbors, uh, but you also just kind of want to be aware. If you have bans, in all of the communities, communities surrounding you, that will make a difference in how you look at your policy decisions. Um, when, when there are leases that have what is called surface rights, there may be very different things beyond gas drilling that go on on those properties. And, and we found in Tompkins County that many of those leases had, had uh, surface rights. Those might be ancillary activities such as water or gravel mining or storage, temporary housing, equipment and material staging areas, and uh, also uh, other kinds of compressor stations and, and pipelines and that sort of thing. Uh, you're going to want to look at which of those things you may want to include in your comprehensive plan one way or another, and again, be even-handed. If you typically allow trailer parks, you can't say, oh, well, we're going to have trailer parks, but not trailer parks with Texans and Oklahomans. You obviously understand why there are some, uh, 
you know, there's some issues with, with doing that. We need to be even handed, but you do want to look seriously at, at these impacts because these have been extremely important impacts in some of the Pennsylvania areas. So here is a map that uh, shows currently in red, uh, you will see those municipalities that currently have a ban in place. In purple, you see those who have put forward a moratorium. And again, the best use of a moratorium, from my opinion, is we're not sure how we're dealing with this. We're going to just hit the pause button for a moment. We're going to update our comprehensive plan using a, a good practice that involves all the stakeholders in putting forward their opinions about this and then we are going to make our decision and go forward. So you don't have this sort of, um, well, my husband's from Oklahoma, so he, he always calls it Sooner Syndrome, where you know we're gonna give everybody a chance to stake their claim, but the Oklahomans got there sooner. You don't want that to happen. You, you wanna make sure that everybody's on an even playing field. Uh, the yellow in this map is areas where there's a citizen movement uh, for a ban or a moratorium. And again, we have a lot of places across the state where people, you know, maybe they just feel like this is moving really fast and town boards and planning boards and concerned citizens want a little chance to catch up and, and understand better and decide what they think about it. We do also have um, municipalities that are going out uh, to make resolutions in support of hydrofracking. Again, you will notice that those are mostly concentrated in the fairway area, which is probably where people have been thinking about it the most. Uh, but, you know, we have a few. We have some even up in Lewis County that, you know, are, are outside of the area that is uh, even in the Utica Shale. So, uh, you know, we have, we have different, uh, different things going here and you will want to be aware, what are my neighbors doing? What are their interests? Um, so, you know, stay on top of that. I have a particular interest in agriculture because I work in agriculture. Uh, again, to stress that you don't have to spend a lot of money to do some very good analysis. In this map, we have the, um, the bans and moratoria in green, and then those, uh, and that is a public data set. And then those little uh, brown dots are uh, land use and land cover uh, that is available from the U.S. government at no charge. Uh, I've been using some of this to sort of take a look at uh, issues about farmland. I don't know if any of you have uh, have in your communities a um, an area that has an agricultural district. If you have an agricultural district, you need to maintain a certain amount of active farmland in order to maintain that district and its advantages. Um, you know, you will want to look at how much farmland do we have, how much will this new activity take up, you know, what are the implications there to existing industry. And again, uh, you know, I can't say enough for GIS, uh, it's, it's really useful. If you can have a planning consultant do it, that's by far the best. If you can't, GIS mapping is a really good job for your educational institutions. They have a lot of people who need to learn this work and, and it would be good to have those maps made no matter how you can get them. Okay, so you did your comp plan. Then it's time to talk about an ordinance or resolution. I know a lot of you may have a lot of pressure from your constituents that they want action now, um, but, but step two is an ordinance or a resolution. You need to be extremely careful that those local laws are adopted using proper procedure. In fact, with local laws, when towns are sued, and I think Chip will back me up on this, um, it's, it's often on procedural grounds rather than substantive grounds. So dot every, every I, cross every T. Uh, reference your comp plan specifically in support of your action. It's not going to be important that you've made the best scientific decision. It is going to be important that your action is consistent with your comprehensive plan. And also make your secret review defensible and document that as well. And then step three is planning to enforce. Um, local law is only useful if it's enforced. You have to make consideration of the enforcement a part of your planning process. Uh, there are going to be violations, so you need to involve enforcers in how it is that you are going to enforce that law. I think it also is important to have a clear channel 
for uh, handling residents reporting there being uh, violations because you are going to uh, need their eyes and ears, particularly in the rural areas, to, to know when, when something is not being followed the way it should be. Thanks very much, and uh, listen up to Nan and Ted.